Hi everyone, so nice to be here today with you all uh, for another subspecialty VMR. And today we have one of my favorites, that's clinical reasoning. And we have two special guests here today. Uh, so my name is Marcela, I am a doctor from Brazil, just met you in internal medicine. Um, and I'm going to introduce our guest today. So first we have Dr. Katie Gavinsky. Uh, she's an academic clinician educator scholars fellow at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. She completed her medical school at the University of Iowa and internal medicine residency in chief year at the UT Southwestern in Dallas, Texas. Uh, Dr. Gavinsky is currently completing her master's degree in medical education through the Institute of, for Clinical Research Education at the University of Pittsburgh. She has a passion for education and clinical reasoning and loves to think about how doctors think. Uh, Katie's dream is to make clinical reasoning more accessible and understandable for all levels of learning. So thank you so much for being here, Katie. Um, and I can see that you have a shared passion with the CP Solvers member that's spread clinical reasoning. Uh, so if you could please talk a little bit about your passion for clinical reasoning, how it started. And also, since we have here Priyanka, if you can share a moment that you have with her as your resident. So thank you so much. Yeah, I'm so excited to be here and I'm excited to learn from all of you today as we go through this case. Um, the reason I got into clinical reasoning was I think I went through medical school figuring I would just eventually know enough and it would all click. Um, and that's all you needed to do. You needed to know enough and practice enough. And I realized that this was a, a skill set that you could actually learn, that there were tools and, and more that we understood about the uh, psychology and the neuropsychology components um, that really make uh, thinking like a doctor, less of a black box. It's not like information in and diagnosis and management out. Um, and that made me really excited to hopefully apply it in my own practice. And then as a clinician educator to help teach and train people and hopefully make it easier for other people so they don't feel quite as lost as I did going through medical school. Um, and then I, I work peripherally with Pri uh, Priyanka. We were talking about, I've never gotten to have her as my resident, unfortunately. Um, but one of the cool things that I love about Priyanka, we're both at the same institution, is that she tweets almost daily, I wanna say at least, it was like almost daily, if not daily, um, something she's learned. And I love reading it every day because it's such an awesome, um, very visible way to deliberately practice her medical knowledge and her clinical reasoning. And it's cool that she chooses to share it with us, um, but she's using so many different elements of adult learning that. So it'll make her so successful in the future. Um, and it's cool to just see her flex that skill every single day. So if you don't follow Priyanka, you should, because you can get a little nugget of knowledge every single day. Oh, I love that. I love to use Twitter for medical education. So, and I saw before we started and just started following Priyanka. Uh, so really excited to follow her and, and learn a lot from her. Uh, so to introduce her here, Dr. Priyanka Solanki is a PGY2 internal medicine resident at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. She went to medical school at the Lewis Katz School of Medicine at Temple University in Philadelphia where she became passionate about using clinical informatics to overcome social determinants of health. She also really enjoys medical education and shares a daily hashtag GIM fact on her Twitter. When she's not geeking uh, out of medicine, she likes running, having tea and biscuits and playing the piano. Uh, so welcome, uh, Priyanka, and I'd love if you could share a little bit more about your passion for clinical reasoning and medical informatics. And also if you could share uh, a share history that you have with Katie. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that fantastic introduction. Um, kind of similar to Katie, I became interested in clinical reasoning in medical school when I was thinking about, when I was actually on my internal medicine rotation, uh, which is a rather difficult rotation for me. And I felt like mm -hmm. I just didn't understand the diagnostic algorithms. And then when I kind of learned about what clinical reasoning was and I broke it down, uh, patients started making a lot more sense to me. And my interest in clinical informatics also uh, developed when I was in medical school. Uh, Temple, where I went to med school, is a very underserved area. And I realized that we're about to start this new era of medicine 
where we can use all this electronic information we have to help overcome some social determinants of health and barriers that uh, some of these patients serve. So that's what I'm hoping to do. We'll be applying it to that fellowship sometime this summer. And the story I wanna sh share about Dr. Gavinsky is actually a recent lecture I attended of hers. Uh, she said she likes to help doctors learn how to think. And something she shared at her recent lecture that I wanna share with all of you has actually started making me change how I approach patients. So I think we're all familiar with the diagnostic reasoning, which is about problem representation and thinking about diagnostic schemas to come up with a differential. She shared a little bit about management reasoning, which I'd never heard before, but it's about thinking about patients from their context and point of view. So when you get a workup, you think about whether or not this actually works for the patient. And I thought this was very interesting because a lot of times we have all these algorithms and guidelines, but sometimes we don't really take that next step to think this is actually possible for the patient. So I've been trying to incorporate a lot of that more when I see patients. Wow, that's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing with us. And if it was an online lecture and it's available, please uh, share with us <laughs> um, but, because I would love to see that. <laughs> uh, so I think we're ready to start. Um, Yasmin or Deborah, can you, you please share the screen and we can start. Okay, so Priyanka, the mic is yours. All right. So chief complaint, shortness of breath. We have a 25 year old female who recently immigrated from China. She's Mandarin speaking only, who's coming in for two days of shortness of breath that started sometime in the afternoon where it's progressed to the point where she feels like my throat is swollen. Um, this is associated with some vague chest pain, non-radiating, non-pleuritic, non-positional, non-exertional. Of note, we're talking to her using the translator, uh, but she is still confused by some of the medical terms that the translator is using. Okay, so Katie, what are your first thoughts? And I was also curious to ask you when you have the situation when you need to choose a translator, uh, does it change your differential or the way that you approach your clinical reasoning or collecting your history? Yeah, these are these are great questions. So I think the the thing that I'll start with is is I kind of trying to label this problem as best I can. Um, and that's one of those skill sets I learned, I think, as a, a medical student, especially as a resident, that really has served me well and made approaching any kind of case, even if I had no idea what's going on, a little bit easier. And so the thing that I heard Priyanka say was acute, you know, it's only been about two days and progressive shortness of breath. Um, I don't know quite where the throat swelling sensation fits in. Um, certainly there's some anatomical components of, you know, if she actually had throat swelling, throat tightness that could cause you to feel short, short of breath. Um, but when I first hear shortness of breath, I start thinking kind of in, in big buckets of whether this could be something cardiac in origin, if it could be pulmonary origin or hematologic thinking, especially about malignancies. Um, right at this point, we don't have any more information. So I, I probably wouldn't go any broader than those big buckets for shortness of breath. Um, and then I have this caveat in my head that she's given us some other information about throat swelling and chest pain that I don't really fully understand. Um, and I, at this point, don't know if that's because that's as well as she can explain them or if there's a, a barrier in, in the interpretation um, and we're not quite getting the whole history. But I, I know at this point, I just need more information. And so I, I'm not gonna like close in on any particular diagnosis or get really excited about anything. Um, I train somewhere um, where we use a lot of interpretation services, and so I know how helpful it can be to have an amazing interpreter and how difficult it can be when you don't have an interpreter or sometimes when families trying to help you interpret um, because you really want as clear of information from the patient as possible. Um, and so if I feel like I'm not getting it, this is a, a time where I may have to go back multiple times. I might have to involve different interpreters. And I may even have to change how I ask my questions um, to use as clean and jargon-free language as possible. 
because I really want to make sure that the patient understands me and that I understand them and what they're expressing. Um, and at this point, it's what I'm struggling with, which it sounds like maybe the team was struggling with is, is, is this an interpretation issue or the way that she's describing her symptoms is just maybe not something that I'm, you know, I'm fully understanding at this point and I need to ask more questions. Well, thank you so much for those teaching throughs. Uh, so Priyanka, tell, please tell, tell us more. Yeah. So the more you talk to her, um, she tells you that really the shortness of breath has just really progressed over the past two days. She's never felt like this before, particularly last month she had COVID and she just had some mild URI symptoms. She didn't take any antivirals, but she noted that she didn't have these current symptoms when she had COVID, which she's heard about you can't have. Um, she's denying any recent fevers, chills, sweats. She does have the occasional cough, but no sputum production, no leg swelling, orthopnea, PND, no nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, no recent travel. Um, of note, because it's been her dyspnea has been progressing over the past two days, she did call EMS. When they first arrived on scene, she was satting 87%. She was put on six liters nasal cannula, then she was satting 94%. She was found with some increased work of breathing. Um, for past medical history, when she was in China, she didn't really follow with any providers or any physicians. She had what she thought was a bug bite a few months ago that occasionally was draining pus, but it hasn't for a while. Surgical history, none. Family history, her mother had diabetes. Social history, she lives alone. She's in the process of learning English. She works at the local factory, factory that produces food products like dyes, um, some chemical compounds for medicines. She's never smoked or vaped. She doesn't use any drugs, she doesn't drink any alcohol, and she does not have any allergies, and she has no medications. Okay, nice. thank okay, you. So, so, so now that we have more information, how does it change your first um, buckets of thinking that you mentioned before? Yeah, so I think the, the most striking thing that I have now is that she's hypoxic. And I think that that's, sorry, there's a couple of toddlers that are about to go to bed next door. Um, the, the hypoxia to me is a, is a big key clinical finding in it. And shortness of breath and hypoxia to me obviously have a, a different um, kind of constellation and collection of diagnoses that I'm gonna start considering. It doesn't really sound like there was a lot of other symptoms surrounding this. Um, and Priyanka did a really nice uh, review of systems kind of asking about some infectious symptoms, um, some kind of um, constitutional symptoms that she didn't have, um, and then some symptoms of just hypervolemia, which she also doesn't have either. So that hypoxia was the most striking. Um, really, this, this, the rest of her history is pretty bare. I do appreciate that um, I heard that she never smoked or vaped, because um, that was something, especially in a young person, I, I, I think, you know, 10 years ago, we weren't necessarily asking about um, vaping. And now we see a lot of people with acute like inhalational injuries from whatever it is that they're vaping. Um, so I'm happy to hear that as kind of a pertinent negative. Um, I don't know as much about the food factory and dyes, what kinds of maybe inhalational exposure she might have there. Um, but I might put that in the back of my mind that that's something that I don't fully understand, you know, what she's exposed to um, while she's working. Um, and then the rest of it, it was, it's, it's nice because it kind of clears the way that she was, I guess we're assuming probably otherwise healthy, doesn't really have other exposures, is not exposed to any other medications. Um, so those are things that, that kind of are offloaded in my brain and we can focus on what, what's going on. Um, I think certainly, you know, in the acute sense, I'm, I'm a little bit worried about her, how hypoxic she was and um, that she came in with these reports of increased work of breathing. Um, I think, again, that shortness of breath and hypoxia are now pushing me down a more pulmonary pathway. Um, and I'm kind of starting to think about different kinds of pulmonary and respiratory etiologies that would cause an acute onset hypoxia um, and increased work of breathing. 
I'd be very curious when we see her to visually just get a look at her and how hard she's working um, and then very quickly get a set of vitals and make sure that she's currently stable um, because it sounds like whatever's been going on has really rapidly progressed. Um, I think that those are kind of my, my next big thoughts. Obviously, her pulmonary and cardiovascular exam, I think, are going to be hopefully useful. They might not tell me a lot. Um, and then I'll, I'll be curious to get onto um, a few imaging and lab modalities, but I don't know if we want to pause there before I go any further. Yeah, Priyanka, please, um, the mic is yours. Um, I'm actually curious, Katie, I want to ask you a question before I provide you the physical exam and vitals. Um, I see a, a comment in the chat that says, I'm curious about what the throat sensation means. And someone like this patient who definitely with the interpreter that we're using had difficulty answering that question in different ways. How, what do you make of that? A comment that in English seems like it could be very concerning, but you don't know how much of that um, how much of it to take to face value? Yeah, I think that's really difficult. And I would, this is someone I really wish I was in front of because, you know, if I could hear that there was hoarseness, if I could see that they were having difficulty um, breathing or like having, you know, a few word dyspnea. So after every couple of words, they were taking a breath. Um, if they had, you know, retra like um, retraction of their um, skeletal muscles as they were breathing. I, I think all of that would help me maybe understand the throat issue um, as well. This is someone where I feel like, it, of course, you should get a good look. And I, I know, with especially with the pandemic, um, we've missed a lot of things that have kind of been like uh, nose and throat because people have been masked. But this is someone who definitely should drop a mask and, and take a good look at that um, when you examine it. Um, I think it's one of those things where I would take that piece of information and say, okay, I know that these this could lead to like some very serious, very bad diagnoses, but I also don't fully understand it. Um, so I would want that collateral on the exam, um, probably almost approaching it like um, you would with someone who comes in who's altered or if you were on pediatrics and you're talking to a patient who maybe can't articulate their symptoms at all, then you have to take as much objective data and that's where your exam becomes really, really important. Thank you, that's that's helpful and, and perfect segue into me giving you the physical exam. Um, so when you see her in the emergency department for her vitals, she's a febrile, her blood pressure is 160 over 75, heart rate 131. She's now satting 99% on four liters, respiratory rate 18, BMI 25. General, She's in very mild distress, int, normocephalic, atraumatic, oropharynx, no signs of erythema, cardiovascular exam, tachycardic, no murmurs, respiratory, diffuse and expiratory wheezing, some increased work of breathing, but no note of accessory muscles. And she does have to catch her breath after several, several sentences to the point where you don't notice it's extremely abnormal. Abdomen, soft, non-tender, non-distended, normal active bowel sounds, MSK, normal range of motion, no swelling, no to anywhere. Skin, there's a two by two centimeter lesion over the left scapula. That's very consistent with the scab. Neuro, cranial nerves, two through 12 intact, no focal deficits. Psych, pleasant mood and affect. And then some initial labs we have in the emergency department. White count, 13.6 hemoglobin 16.6, hematocrit 48.8, platelets 334, sodium 141, potassium 3.8, chloride 105, bicarb 24, BUN 13, creatinine 1.1, glucose 83, and just some initial diagnostics we have. We have an EKG that just demonstrates sinus tack with right ventricular hypertrophy and a chest x-ray that shows diffuse mild bilateral interstitial opacities and no focal consolidation. Okay, Katie, so how does that physical exam and initial labs help you on your reasoning? 
And also, what would, would be your next steps on the evaluation of the patient? Yeah, so that was a, a nice thorough exam. I just want to clarify, Priyanka, when you said the there's a mild increased work of breathing, and is it it is noticeable that she has to catch her breath, or it is not noticeable? It's it's not noticeable. She pauses to catch her breath after several sentences, to the point where if you're talking to someone who doesn't have increased work of breathing, is also pausing catch your breath after talking for a while. Okay, so not not super. Hard. That part was not super impressive. I think, you know, one of the skill sets I learned as a medical student, and I think especially as an intern, um, that I practice as people go through and you're either taking a history or you're having to write your HMP up, is really trying to pull out those key clinical findings. So what is abnormal and what is normal but maybe shouldn't be, um, or what is discordant with what's going on. Um, and so the things that I heard Priyanka say that I, I'm more concerned about um, she's hypertensive. She was tachycardic. She was potentially mildly tachypneic. The 18 is not super impressive, but obviously is, is faster than maybe a, an average of 12. She was definitely hypoxic again on our exam. Um, and then she gave us a, a, a great HENT exam where we saw that the oropharynx looked up, you know, normal as far as we could tell. Um, and then the pulmonary exam was the, the other part that really had the most notable findings with these diffuse wheezing no accessory muscle use, really could speak multiple sentences before she had to take a breath. So at this point, it doesn't sound like she's working quite as hard to breathe and is conversational with you while you're examining her. Um, and then from the lab, um, I, we saw that leukocytosis. Do we have a differential on the leukocytosis, Priyanka? We do. Um, percent EOs, 3.9, absolute EOs was normal. Lymphocyte percentage was 15. Um, absolute lymphocytes was normal. And percent neutrophils was 80. Okay, so neutrophil predominant. Um, and then um, she has an elevated hemoglobin, um, which there's a couple of things that cause it, but at this point, I'm probably saying that she's maybe um, hemoconcentrated would kind of be my first thought and probably moving on. But want to note that at least it's there, and I don't know that for sure. Um, and then she does also have elevated platelets. Um, for EKG, sinus tachycardia, I kind of expected that based off of the kind of constellation of signs and symptoms. The right ventricular hypertrophy is imp impressive to me. It's not something that I, I was expecting um, for her, so I'm not quite sure what to do with that, but I'm taking note of it. And then certainly the chest x-ray, which was, was kind of what I wanted. The diffuse wheezing on exam didn't really tell me a whole lot other than there's something going on that's potentially a pulmonary process. Um, and the x-ray told me that there's something going on that's potentially a pulmonary process, and it's bilateral, right? So it's involving both lobes. So at this point, you know, with her acute progressive shortness of breath, that was her chief complaint with associated documented hypoxia. You know, I'm really honing on that this is probably a respiratory etiology for her symptoms. Um, she has associated leukocytosis and sinus tachycardia. Um, and so in my, she's in the ED mind frame, and this is acute and progressive. Um, one of the first things that I, you know, know as on my differential that I have to rule out is, um, does she have a pulmonary embolism? Um, and so that's something that either I'm going to order, I'm hoping my ED colleagues will have already ordered by the time I saw her. Um, you know, there's lots of other things that could be going on, but that would be the most dangerous thing at this point in a young woman that I would want to rule out. Um, wouldn't usually typically present with bilateral infiltrates, not necessarily present with bilateral wheezing, but the, the tachycardia and the hypoxia would be concerning enough for me. Um, after that, though, you know, I, I'm hoping we'll get a CTA to rule that out. That'll also probably give us a decent look at her parenchyma um, to tell us a little bit more about what these interstitial opacities are. Um, you know, at this point, I, I'm not quite sure what's causing such an acute um, decline without other really associated symptoms. Um, so I'd be looking for that PT to give me, you know, the PE, no PE, but then also some information on the parenchyma, whether there's maybe some effusions or volume that we didn't pick up on the rest of her exam. Um, and then if it has a particular pattern that would fit um, with any uh, sort of, you know, uh, lung injury, either an inhalational injury, because she does have this interesting occupational exposure that I don't understand. Um, 
or, you know, infectious etiology, because she certainly does have a, a neutrophil predominant leukocytosis. Uh, and in this day and age, I'm, I'm sure she's been swapped for COVID, so I also want to know her COVID status. Um, that's something that I now actually take for granted we, we most often have. And I love that there's um, a couple comments in the chat about how she had COVID and that puts her at risk for hypercoagulable state. That's something that we certainly know but don't fully understand. So I love that comment. Um, and then, uh, you know, atypical pneumonia versus underlying ILD. So, you know, those, I like both of those thoughts on the differential. The interesting thing is both atypical pneumonia and underlying um, interstitial lung disease, I'd expect to have more of a subacute to chronic presentation. Um, I wouldn't expect it this acute. Um, but, you know, we also understand our history was maybe a little bit limited. Maybe we're missing some information. Um, but again, I think getting that look at the parenchyma and the CT scan will give us a lot more that unfortunately our excellent exam and our chest x-ray just couldn't tell us about. Well, thank you so much. Priyanka, we are all curious to know more, please. All right. So, um, a little bit more uh, labs, AST 28, ALT 21, Aquafos 66, calcium 9.1, albumin 4.5, total protein 8.4, Billy 0.6, um, lactate 2.7, ABG upon her initial arrival, pH 7.3, um, CO2 43, O2 72, she was COVID negative, troponin negative, D dimer negative, BNP negative. CTA chest was non diagnostic for PE due to motion artifact with the specific comment of consider repeating study if patient can tolerate better breath hold, ground glass opacities and right lower lobes, and a vascular malformation within the lingula with feeding vessels above and below the diaphragm with numerous dilated pulmonary artery and pulmonary vein structures, most consistent with an AVM. There were blood cultures drawn that ended up resulting as two out of four bottles positive or staph at B. And then when you talk to the patient a little bit more um, after a couple of days, she says, I feel like when I think about when I first started having these symptoms, I was definitely at work. I typically wear all of my equipment, but maybe I was exposed to something, but I'm not really sure. Okay, so Kate, with this new information, what are you thinking right now? Yeah, I think that was a lot of, a lot of great information. I think, you know, the ABG confirms what we know is that she's hypoxic. Now we can say she's hypoxemic, right? Because we have an ABG. Um, it doesn't sound, our blood cultures sound like they were a contaminant. So I'm not quite as worried about that. And she doesn't give us a story other than maybe her leukocytosis that of a, like infectious etiology, acute infectious etiology, but that's certainly possible. Um, but less, less likely that staph epi is I think a, a true bug and, and rather probably a contaminant, even if it's two out of four. Um, the CT, which was non-diagnostic, is, is a little bit unfortunate because that's something I would love to have. It's interesting her D-dimer was negative, um, and you think a lot about pre- and post-test probabilities. I think in my head, given her, her recent, recent COVID and her constellation of, of signs and symptoms, my pre-test probability is still moderate, even with a negative D-dimer. And so in that case, you know, I don't know that I could use it to rule out the need for a repeat CT. Um, and she does have parenchymal findings, so I think I'd have in the back of my head that I might still want to repeat a CT scan at some point in time. Um, it's interesting that she's got these um, AVM um, on her an exam, and I, I don't fully have an explanation or, or can't really tie how that would be causing her symptoms acutely right now because it sounds like they've potentially been there chronically. Um, and then this exposure at work is interesting because I think that was one of the things I was questioning from the beginning was, you know, what's happening? What kind of protective equipment do they have to wear? Um, you know, is it being worn appropriately? Is it the right equipment? Um, and, and just kind of what, you know, even with processing food, there's a lot of like dust and particulate that you can be exposed to. Um, and it sounds like maybe she's making some sort of connection. 
I used to think uh, as a medical student that asking the patient what they thought was going on was cheating and that you should, as a doctor, be able to figure out exactly what's going on. Um, and I now appreciate that every time I ask that question, I never regret it. Um, people end up giving you history. They end up giving you bits of information and how they um, piece the puzzle together in their mind. That's always useful. And at the absolute worst, they tell you what they're worried about and you can actually address that. Um, and so this might be an opportunity to follow up and say, what do you wear at work? What are you exposed to? You know, can I, is there someone I could call at work to understand a little bit more about your occupational health exposures? Um, because it might help you in this case, take better care of this patient. Um, this is an, a, a point in time too, where I might be talking to my pulmonary colleagues and saying, you know, I'm guessing at this point, she's still hypoxic after we've gotten these tests back. Um, we don't have a, a clear understanding of exactly what's going on, um, but I'm worried at this point about maybe an inhalational injury of some kind, um, and I'd, I'd like to know more about that. Um, there's lots of great differentials that people are throwing into the, the chat about what ground glass opacities can be, which is that they're, it's very broad. It can represent almost anything. Um, and so um, I've got a good, like someone's got a good water, pus, cells, blood, or protein. Um, so I, I think at this point, we still don't know exactly what's going on. Um, and I would need a little bit um, additional help also maybe teasing out, do I go for the CTA and repeat a contrasted study to really confirm that she doesn't have a PE, which is less likely, but not completely unlikely. Or should I get something like a non-contrasted CT, which is going to give me a better look at her parenchyma and maybe understand a little bit more about, about one of my concerns, which is that she has some sort of inhalational exposure um, that could be causing her signs and symptoms. Uh, the rest of the, the, the labs that I got from you really were unremarkable for there really being, I think, like other organ involvement. Um, I think the one thing that is still kind of percolating in the back of my mind is that she had this RVH on her um, EKG. And I don't know if that could all just be explained by the, the ABM or if there's some other process that was more chronic than the acute process that she's presenting with right now. Um, so if this was something chronic and she had a precipitous drop off or if these are two kind of unrelated things. Thank you so much. I really love the teaching point about asking the patient about their thoughts about their, their disease and how it can be helpful. Uh, so Priyanka, please tell us more. Um, so one of the thoughts that we also had as a team was whether or not we should repeat the CTA right when we got those initial findings. And we thought it was interesting that we had the comment of consider repeating study a patient can tolerate better breath hold which made us realize that while she was getting the scan, she probably didn't understand, please hold your breath. And I think it would have been difficult for the um, radiology text down there to go ahead and, and get a translator to talk to her. So how, um, when you have such a barrier like that, and you know you have such an important diagnostic testing, how do you get patients to basically cooperate with the exam? Yeah, so this is this is where having it. You absolutely have to have an interpreter. I mean, anyone who's not you're not speaking the same primary language, you're not certified to interpret. Um, you know, you really should have an interpreter there. Best case scenario in person. Um, you know, oftentimes we now even have video technology where someone can be conferenced in by video um, or audio. Um, I know a lot of institutions have mobile phones that you can either like cart into the room or an actual app on your phone where you can have a um, interpreter with you. But this is where it's so important that you absolutely need to be speaking the same language as your patient um, and that there's this huge opportunity for error. Um, and that's, I'm glad you pointed that out. I think my other thought was, is it too hard for her to take that breath, which I, it didn't sound like when you um, presented her exam, or was it that she didn't understand what she needed to do? Um, and so ideally, you'd actually have the interpreter, you know, on the phone, maybe giving instructions um, through the radiology text in, in the CT room. Um, worst case scenario, you maybe have someone, um, you know, interpret with you in the, in the exam room, um, explain to her what they're going to ask her to do, and then remind the text that they're going to need to demonstrate, you know, exactly when they want what they want. Um, but really unfortunate that it sounds like she potentially got exposed to radiation and contrast 
and didn't get the study results that you wanted and that the barrier was really more of a communication one. Um, and so I think it just goes back to that importance of you really need to be communicating to the patient in whatever their language uh, of preference is and what their um, what they feel they can um, best understand and best communicate you with 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 you with. Thank you. And that's certainly very helpful, but because I think um, we definitely should not avoid to try to give half care when we have certain barriers like that. Um, and we certainly have the resources to communicate with those patients. Um, so I can give you the last set of information about this patient. So um, she got, a, we talked to pulmonary about the CT findings and their thoughts was that this was a congenital AVM. It's unlikely to be causing the symptoms. Um, perhaps it could have caused the EKG findings, just follow up with a CT, CTA in two years. She did end up getting treatment with solumedrol, supplemental O2, um, two liters of IV fluids. Her lactate came down to 1.0. She was statting um, room air 95% after his treatment. And then within 24 hours, all of her symptoms of dyspnea improved. Wow. Well, I think the interesting thing, you know, I agree that AVM sounded like they've been there for a while based off of the, the imaging findings that you had. Um, and it's helpful, I think, to connect that with, with the right ventricular hypertrophy, because at least that gives me a potential explanation for that, that her acute symptoms wouldn't explain. Um, the tightness that she described in her throat um, and the increased work of breathing and the hypoxia um, besides some sort of inhalational exposure, which I don't know that I would have expected to get back better with solumedrol. The other thing I would think about is if someone who has a new diagnosis of asthma, um, which, you know, could be something that would explain kind of her constellation of symptoms, would explain potentially a response to getting um, bronchodilators and some steroids, um, and might be a difficult thing to articulate through an interpreter, especially if she doesn't have a, a prior history of this. Also could be, you know, um, some type of reactive airway disease just from whatever it is she's exposed to at work because it, again, sounds like it was acute and onset and has been um, resolved. One of the things you have to be careful of is there's this um, type of bias um, that you can get that's like a confirmation um, bias that you treat someone, you know, and they get better and so you assume that you have they have whatever you treated them for. Um, but for instance, you know, someone could have a virus and I can give them antibiotics and they get better. And that doesn't mean that they ever had a bacterial infection. Um, so I'd be cautious to say at this point that she had, you know, asthma or reactive airway disease because she got better with bronchodilators and steroids. Um, at this point, you know, it sounds like it started at work. I'm still concerned that there was some sort of, you know, I think you said food factory and dye so that if there's some sort of um, particulate or, or chemical exposure there that she could have inhaled, um, that that could, could have caused her acute symptoms. Um, and then, you know, maybe she has some sort of reactive area disease. And I'd, I'd be curious to go back and see if with an interpreter, you could clarify whether she'd had, um, I think you said initially she's had no prior episodes like this, but if, if she had anything even on a much milder scale like this, or if she had exercise-induced asthma or something like that. Um, and then when she left the hospital, because it sounds like we fixed her, we're not quite sure what's wrong, but we fixed her. Um, you know, this is someone who I'd want follow up for those AVMs. I'd want her to get repeat imaging and see pulmonary as they recommended, but I'd probably want her to get PFTs as an outpatient, um, especially if she left with any sort of diagnostic uncertainty about what was going, going on. Yeah, that's amazing. Thank you so much. So Priyanka, um, you're yeah, very curious to know what happened. Um, so given that she improved so quickly um, and we did end up watching her for a couple of days just to make sure the staff epi, whether or not it was real, but she was not having any fevers. Um, she was feeling fine. We ultimately gave her the diagnosis of chemical pneumonitis secondary to inhalation exposure from work. Um, unfortunately, she was lost to follow up. She did not follow up to get a repeat CTA. She did not see pulmonary. But 
um, something that we did consider was whether or not this was asthma exacerbation, but she said this definitely did not happen before. And on that particular day of work, she probably might not have worn all of her equipment as she was supposed to. Um, the points that I, I want to share a little bit about chemical pneumonitis, because I don't think it's something that we think about a lot. It's certainly not at the top of my differential when I think of shortness of breath. Um, and it was something interesting you brought up, um, Dr. Davidsky, about whether or not we should have steroids. And it's a little bit controversial. It depends on the type of chemical pneumonitis. Uh, for her, we can never figure out what she was exposed to exactly. Um, normally, the treatment for chemical pneumonitis is just um, supportive. So oxygen, duonebs, IV fluids, if they seem dehydrated, which she was a little bit dehydrated. Sometimes people consider high dose steroids early on to help prevent scarring, uh, help with the anti-inflammatory properties. Um, and in this case, um, it could have had uh, made some difference for her. And then I thought it was a little bit interesting about her pulmonary AVM because that's not that was something I thought um, probably could have played a larger role in her presentation, but pulmonary AVMs, a lot of the times they are found in the lower lobes and they actually are congenital, like her, for her, and they very rarely affect any cardiac hemodynamics, so cardiac index, blood pressure, heart rate. She could have had a little bit extra shunting, which is why she might have had some residual, um, pulmonary hypertension leading to right ventricular hypertrophy on the EKG. It would be interesting if she, um, she could have an echo, we can see um, some of her numbers, but um, this was a red herring for me in this case for her. Well, thank you so much, Priyanka, for uh, sharing this case and amazing teaching points. And Katie, I was wondering if you have any final teaching points or reflection about the case looking now that we have the final diagnosis. Yeah, I think what's really interesting, and Priyanka kind of pointed that out, the, the ABMs and the right ventricular hypertrophy, I think um, when I, I got that first aliquot and got the HPI, I was like, this is acute onset. It is severe because it's driving a 25-year-old to call EMS. Like that to me, that's, it's severe and progressive and it's acute. Um, and once I saw the AVMs and the right ventricular hypertrophy, those were obviously, I think, important findings because we didn't know about them previously. And it sounds like she didn't know about them previously. Um, but for me, it kind of shifted my thought process in terms of, is this really a chronic process that's now just, a, you know, progressed to the point of, of her presenting with something acutely. Um, and, and that really kind of shifted me a little bit away from some of the things that would just present really acutely. Um, and then I think the other thing that uh, Priyanka did really, really well is that she interspersed in those aliquots these questions of, are we really getting all of the information that we need from this patient? How can we better communicate with this patient? And, and the unfortunate outcome of, you know, she went through a CT scan and was exposed to radiation, but, you know, and we, I think that was appropriate, but we didn't even get all the information we wanted. And maybe a part of it was uh, a language barrier. And so how important is it to really involve the patient in all of your communications and being speak, uh, you should be speaking to that patient um, in their primary language through an interpreter um, what, however, however you can to make sure that you get information that's as accurate as possible. Um, and the other amazing thing that I just want to point out that Priyanka and her team did is that they, um, they got this great social history. A lot of times when I'm listening for social history, I'm like tobacco, alcohol, drug use, and I, I end there and I forget to ask about all the other things. Um, as the attending, sometimes I get to go in and spend a little bit more time learning about people's families and their pets and, and things like that because um, you know, the, the rest of the team is making those, those hard hitting decisions. But I, I thought that this was so wonderful that they took a really clear history and got this occupational history really early on. Um, and if she had not given me that information, I don't think that I would have been thinking about anything inhalational in a 25 year old who um, had moved to the U.S. Um, recently, you know, I think I probably would have honed much more on like a reactive airway process and, and not really thought about um, what's happening because most of the 25 year olds I meet, you know, aren't working in this particular environment and don't have to worry about these kinds of exposures that she has to. So I, I really applaud them for taking a real social history. Um, Gupreet Dhaliwal, who writes a lot about clinical reasoning, talks about how important the social history is and it's, that it's uh, far above and beyond just asking about 
um, alcohol, drugs, and tobacco. And so I think that that was an amazing um, piece of information that made a big difference in this patient's case. And I hope at some point that she is able to follow up and would love to see what her follow-up CT and echo look like. And hopefully that she doesn't have any more um, episodes like this and has the appropriate protective equipment to be working wherever she is working. Uh, we have a question in the chat. Uh, is chemical pneumonitis um, a subtype of hypersensitive pneumonitis? Oh, that's a, a good question. Um, you know, I don't actually know, like in my framework for where it would go, I'm not quite sure how I would differentiate the two. I'd have to clarify with a, with a pulmonologist. And certainly if anyone else has input, I would love to hear it. Um, but usually I, I think about it as, you know, in, in the context of when pa patients are working in environments like this where they may have um, more particulate, they, they should be wearing some type of PPE. Um, and in general, if there's any concerns about their, their working conditions. Um, I think every place I've trained, there's been different types of occupational exposures kind of regionally that are different. Um, and, you know, I think um, when I trained in Iowa, it was a lot more people working for um, pig and chicken farms, and so they had exposure to salmonella and E. coli. Um, and then here, kind of in the mid-Atlantic region, we have more factories like like this. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, Priyanka, I was just wondering if you have any final reflections and how was the experience to take care of the patient considering the social history and the difficulty to collect the history? Yeah. Um... I think my biggest takeaway point from this case, um, which is why I asked um, Katie a lot of these questions was the importance about using a translator because when this patient initially presented, and I think whenever we are given sign up for the emergency department, we look a lot at the vitals. Uh, we think a lot about the history taken from the emergency department. And she initially presented as a very, very scary patient. Um, she, and almost to the point where I was thinking, does she need to get to the ICU? Is she gonna make it over the, overnight? But then you get a completely different story when you talk to her in person using the translator and you're able to put a little bit more context. Um, and it really helped me to kind of take a step back and not be um, so nervous to make quick action that we have a little bit of time. Yeah, thank you so much for that reflection. And thank you both again for being here today. We had an amazing discussion and I'm sure everyone learned a lot. Uh, so now I'm going to pass the mic to Yasmin for our teaching points. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Solanke and Dr. Gavinsky for bringing this great case and amazing discussion. For our teaching points today, we start with shortness of breath, putting everything on three buckets being cardiac versus lung versus uh, malignancy. And when there is hypoxia associated, we can think of lung origin. Uh, also, when the, in this case with this patient who we couldn't communicate with, the patient refers a subjective issue, take the objective data of, from physical examination. If there's hoarseness, strider, retraction of chest, et cetera. As well, the time of pro progression that can help us in a diagnostic, uh, differential diagnostic, an acute process can orient us more to an emergent di diagnosis such as PE, while a subacute process can orient us to pneumonia. Also be very careful when taking a history, the social history, past medical history, it can all orient us to an exposure and to the diagnosis. Now uh, we approach to the di differential diagnosis with labs and imaging. If there is an increased hemoglobin, first thing if it's not hemoconcentration. And when there's leukocytosis and tachycardia, you can think of an acute and progressive um, issue. So first rule out the most emergent things, which could be PE. Look for patterns in the lung imaging. If there's infectious, infiltrative, interstitial etiology, ground, grass, <laughs> ground glass opacities can be edema, pus, cells, blood, and protein. And when we saw the R A RVH, Dr. Gavinsky told us that could this be due to an AVM or this is an acute or chronic issue that could take us away from the different from the diagnosis? So we could need uh, to we could need to repeat the imaging to determine it. 
And another little pearl that we had is that most AVMs are detected as an incidental finding with the exception of congenital AVMs. Now, this uh, discussion was very interesting because we found out the importance of having an interpreter or a translator when having a patient whose first language is not English. We have always to look for occupational environmental exposure and asking the patient about their perspective of the geology can help us as well as uh, reformulate questions to establish good rapport with patients through the translator can be a, a little bit difficult. So we can also consider if there is something lost in translation and may require to change the questions or try to reformulate them. Now, uh, for patients whose first language is not always, uh, first language is not English, always have this interpreter to explain the medical processes to our patients so they are not scared of what is going to happen to them. And again, the steroids uh, treatment can be controversial depending on the type of pneumonitis. So first confirmed exposure. Unfortunately, this patient was lost in follow-up. So Dr. Zelensky told us that she couldn't know, but always take this into consideration. And these are all the great teaching points from today. Thank you, Dr. Zelensky. Thank you, Dr. Gavinsky. And thank you for all the pearls in the chat. Go back to you, Marce. Thank you all so much for being here. Uh, we had an amazing discussion and teaching points. Uh, so we hope to see you soon. Bye. Thanks for having us. Thank you. <laughs>